Uh, hello. And thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, yes, the title of the uh, lecture is In a Silent Way, which is a Miles Davis uh, album, but I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, with presenting the office using four words, uh, list, chaos, silence and fragmentation. Uh, I will not so much explain, let's say, how we do our drawings, but more uh, rather uh, why we do them the way we do them and what is the kind of um, thing behind them that we are uh, eagerly looking for. Uh, it's true that for the moment the office is seven years old or something like that. We did much more drawings than buildings. Um, so uh, I guess I'm here more to talk about the drawings that, than about the buildings, but I will try to talk about both. Um, Yes, so the first one, list, um, it's the name of the office. Uh, when I created the office, the idea was uh, uh, I just looked for a name. I didn't want to call it with my own name. I wanted to be more inclusive to other people uh, later on. And, and so the name list was just a list, uh, which is for me the most, let's say, basic form of intelligence. Uh, it's not a conceptual thinking. It's not something very elaborated. Uh, it's just uh, when you don't know what to do, when you have too many things in mind, when the reality is too complex, you just do a list. This one is by Johnny Cash. Um, and also, uh, let's say a list is, is, is a way of dealing with a very complex situation, very complex urban environment or just environment. And when you don't know how to describe something which is very complex, you just list the thing which are inside the image, for example. So it's both, uh, let's say, a list in the terms of writing uh, down things, but also a way of describing uh, the contemporary world. Uh, what I also like about it is that it is able to um, include gaps, lacunas. Uh, so you can attach, when you do a list, you are not uh, obliged to explain what is the relation between number one, two, three, four in the list. You just assemble them and then uh, it can assemble a very heterogeneous uh, field of references or ideas. It is also uh, a very, uh, it has some kind of aesthetical uh, existence, very basic way of assembling ideas, putting them together. This is a Flemish artist, Jan Geis. I don't know how to, exp to, to pronounce it very well. Uh, uh, it's uh, 132 questions to a woman. Um, and also for the, for the kind of rhetoric uh, force of the list, uh, <coughs> not to mention the Ten Commandments, but this is the uh, Ad Reinhardt's 12 rules for a new academy. So just by ruling out everything, no texture, no brushwork, no drawing, no form, no design, uh, there is a particular way of creating an idea by just listing uh, what is not there. Um, this one is a, is a piece of art by Hans-Peter Feldman, uh, which is an iconographer and an artist that just took in pictures all the 70 uh, clothes of a woman uh, from, a, uh, from, a, from a cardboard and just put them together. Uh, the idea of that is also that uh, the list is a way of um, describing things which is not by essence but by, uh, pa by characteristic. That means that, for example, if a child asks his mother what is a tiger, uh, she can explain to him by essence that the tiger is and give him the Latin word for that, but she can also say that it's just like a cat, but bigger, runs faster, more ferocious, etc., etc. So listing things and combining them together is a way of um, addressing uh, uh, the environment which is too complex. Uh, the second word is chaos, which is a myth of course, but it's also somehow a kind of urban reality, especially here in Flanders, uh, but also elsewhere around the world, where the urban environment is somehow composed of uh, a multitude of fragments, uh, very different one from the other, which is very difficult to read also as an environment, whether you look at them from the map or from the from the airplane, but also where you're inside of them. And then it's still a combination of all these different fragments together. None of them you see completely. None of them was completed, but all of them somehow coexist. This is the map, I think, which is in the exhibition from Xavier de Gator. Uh, so uh, this chaos, which looks a little bit like uh, Jackson Pollock's uh, drip paintings, is very interesting for us in the way that there is somehow no up, no down, no right, no left. Everything is somehow equal and everything is in the same time extremely different and uh, uh, specific. 
What is interesting for me, let's say, uh, in the myth of chaos is to say that you can try and read this extremely complex environment as a scientific project try to really describe and explain where does this ribbon development come from and what is the history of this city and of this town. Uh, but you can also try to somehow try to absorb it as a whole and the myth of chaos is very interesting for that. I'll try to read to you two uh, experts, two parts, two, two fragments which are very interesting. This one is uh, Ovid on metamorphosis explaining that what is chaos. Before the sea, the earth and the sky that covers all, the nature in the entire universe offered one single and homogeneous aspect. It was called chaos. It was an informed and confused mass, an inert block, a stack of elements not well united and discordant. Everywhere around the earth, there was also sea and air. Thus the earth was unstable, the sea unsuitable for navigation, the air deprived of light. No element could preserve its form, each of them was an obstacle for the others because in every single corpse the cold was fighting against the warm, the humid against the dry, the soft against the hard, the heavy against the light. So that means that chaos is somehow the assemblage of everything altogether. What is also interesting about this text is that um, if you read it well, it's sometimes what it tries to say is also that God didn't create the world. The gods didn't create the world. What they did, just said, what they did is just to separate things. So they separated uh, the air from the sea, they separated uh, elements, and they gave them their visibility. Because as a chaos, uh, they didn't have a visibility, it was just one single um, inert thing. This one is another text, uh, a Taoist text, called also about chaos, because in, ta in Tao, chaos is something which is considered to be very qualitative, as the essence of life. So it's a short story by Huang Tzu. It's about the emperor of the south that was called Shu, and the emperor of the north that was called Hu, and the emperor of the center that was called Chaos. Shu and Hu, at times, mutually came together and met in chaos territory. Chaos treated them very generously. Shu and Hu then discussed how they could reciprocate uh, chaos virtue, saying men all have seven openings in order to see, hear, eat, and breathe. He alone doesn't have any. Let's try boring him some. Each day they bored one hole, and on the seventh day chaos died. It's a very nice story because it's, it's a bit obscure, but the idea is that um, all men have seven uh, openings, eyes, uh, nose, etc. That somehow gives them form, uh, an image. Chaos doesn't have an image. It's something completely uh, unfigurable. So the idea about that, that they wanted to thank him, and so they bore holes in him, but some, so they tried to civilize him. But by trying to civilize him and to give him form, they somehow killed his most essential uh, dynamic and, 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 uh, and uh, force of existence. This also gives the name, the Hantan chaos gives also the name to the wonton soup, which is a famous Chinese soup, which is somehow uh, everything is uh, mingled together, a little bit like Flanders. Um, the third word is uh, silence or uh, tranquility. And the thing is, is let's say passing from uh, an observation to the t of the territory to the one that observes or to the architect or to ourselves. So it's more the attitude that we try to develop towards this uh, urban chaos, which is an attitude of acceptance, which is trying to avoid to condemn chaos as something uh, unwanted, ultra liberal, uh, unaccepted, unorganized, etc nor to celebrate it as some kind of uh, beautiful chaos, like, for example, uh, Rem Colas did in uh, uh, Mutations or uh, uh, Venturi in Learning from Las Vegas that somehow celebrated chaos. So our idea is to say that um, we don't want to celebrate chaos, we don't want to uh, condemn it, we just want to live in peace with it, in tranquility and silence. Um, so these are just a series of kind of grayish images that we like. Uh, which for us aim at some kind of gray quality towards this um, uh, uh, a, a field of vision which is not completely clear and uh, uh, yeah. So Miles Davis in a silent way. I chose this album just as a, as a title for the lecture first because it's a very beautiful album and then also because it's a very uh, important moment in Davis' career in which he passes um, from um, 
from jazz to fusion, uh, that means using electro guitars at the end of the 60s. And instead of, let's say, doing this passage in a very kind of brutal way, which suits well the electro guitars and the drums and the rock, uh, he chooses to do it in a very silent way. So he does a very um, radical album, but without any what we call pathos, uh, without any uh, extravagant uh, way of saying that, just by simply hesitating and by adjusting and combining fragments of music together. It's very nice because it's, um, it's with uh, John McLaughlin, the um, guitarist. Uh, and at the first, he started, uh, when they recorded it, he started playing that and Miles found the way he played much too charged. So we told him to play as if he didn't know how to play. So we asked him to play that and then he really plays extremely slowly. It's very beautiful, they recorded it and this is the version which is on the album. Uh, I put this very nice quote from uh, Robert Bresson, a French um, um, movie director. A great non-virtuoso pianist of the Lipati kind strikes notes that are rigorously equal, minims, each the same length, same intensity, quavers, semi-quavers, etc. Likewise, he does not slap emotion onto the keys, he waits for it, it comes and fills his finger, the piano, in the audience. I find it very beautiful the way he describes that because he's a movie director trying to create emotions necessarily, just like Miles with his music, but trying to do that in a way that is kind of percolating in a very silent way without creating any drama and by using only flat and very simple images and without overplaying nothing. So, um, <coughs> I think what we try to do in, in our projects is to somehow play with this idea and trying to create this kind of grayish uh, quality, relation to the environment, to nature, to the outside world, and to create this kind of gray quality of architecture that is not based on a very, um, um, how to say that? Um, yeah, it doesn't speak loud. Architecture that doesn't speak loud, but is not necessarily discrete, because what is also beautiful in the in a Miles album, it's that it's not a discrete album, it's not a... Uh, there are a lot of kind of radical choices, uh, but in the same time they are just expressed in a silent way. Last word is fragmentation. Um, these are just images from an installation we did for the Chicago Biennial. Uh, very grayish, huh? they almost, uh, our installation, our fragments almost disappeared on the walls. Um, I think what we try to do there is actually to work with this idea of fragments, to reassemble them, to consider that our work as architects and urbanists is to observe things and to re somehow reshuffle them, rearrange them. And uh, this is this on, on, on this uh, this was the first shelf we did, huh? the one on the left. And on this shelf we did this kind of we wrote a small manifesto, and this is just an expert from the manifesto in which we wrote, while our cities seem to transform into a dispersion of objects, practices and economies, we believe our gaze should not try to resist this atomization, but follow Nietzsche's invitation to make the universe crumble into pieces, lose the O of the whole. We at least try to actively accept and represent a world that is more than ever thrown, unfolded, offered, rather than a world constructed and elaborated. So for us, it represents really our uh, will to um, just grasp pieces of the world, work with them, combine them in some kind of strange way and assume the way that some gaps are just left there uh, and everything is not combined into some kind of conceptual thinking. Another quote from Bresson saying that fragmentation is necessary if one does not want to fall into representation, to see beings and things in their separate parts, render them independent in order to give them a new dependence. These are just drawings. Maybe I can talk a bit about the drawings. This one, for example, it was one of the first drawings I think we did in the office. It was for a competition in uh, Geneva. And we call that a chronotop. Chronotop is uh, the idea of combining time and space in the same uh, element. And so it was just a kind of phasing idea. Uh, like in each urban competition, you need to do some kind of reflection about phasing, what to do first, what to do second. But then we couldn't find any um, right phasing. So we just did this gigantic thing that took into account so many uh, different um, 
parameters and try to recombine them in very uh, different ways. So it was a very long drawing, two meter uh, long. This one is another one for Alst uh, that represents the project in relation to different scales and all that. I think what we also try to do with these kind of drawings is we try to combine things which are normally not perceived together. That's the question of, for example, time and space or uh, different scales, different distances that we like to somehow embed in one single image because somehow we have the, the feeling that, um, let's say when I was a student, uh, everyone told me that, let's say a teacher taught us that uh, everything should be thought from the city uh, to the district, uh, to the environment, to the building, to the palier, to the apartment, etc., etc. But this transition of scales for me is no longer really uh, lived in that way today with our smartphones and mobility and all that. So the idea is to also uh, embed somehow a larger scale and smaller scale in one single image, which is of course always a very difficult task. This is another example. It's our model of the Casterly project uh, that was presented in Chicago. And of course, for us, the most uh, uh, successful uh, example ever for this kind of uh, manipulation is Sol Steinberg uh, uh, that always kind of um, embedded everything and took some scales out of the drawings, left some scales inside the drawing, and always by manipulating these images, create always uh, content by actually putting things together in a new way. Okay, that was the intro. Um, so now I, I'll just flip through a few projects. I'll try to do it quite quickly, not to actually explain everything, but just uh, flip through them. If uh, from time to time I, I, uh, there is some kind of interesting drawing, drawing to comment, maybe I'll do that uh, more, uh, take some, some more time to do that. So this is a project we did together with a Japanese uh, architect and a friend called Hideyuki Nakayama. Um, it was our first building. Uh, initially, we replied to this open group competition uh, with the idea that we come mostly from, uh, can, let's say, the urban field. And Akayama comes really from a design field, uh, designing also door handles and beautiful objects. And we thought that this very strange environment uh, that was designed by Lou Janssen in the 70s was something in which we could actually work together these very different uh, scales and uh, form a nice team. This is the building that was built by Janssen uh, in 72 uh, that needed an extension. Today it's a graphic atelier, a very, very nice uh, world famous graphic atelier for, uh, for residents. Um, of course, Lou Janssen is a part of what's called the Turnhout School, but this maybe you know better than us. Um, so it's very, very interesting and intriguing in terms of architecture. So the building is a dome. Uh, it was built as a dome because Janssen wanted to um, avoid uh, the factory effect. At the time, graphic, graphic art was considered to be a second zone art, uh, not as important as painting or sculpture, etc. So uh, he wanted to avoid to have a big room, plenty of machines. So in actually this disposition, each artist is just working towards the landscape and there is no uh, big hall of machines. This is the center from the 70s. You see the dome, you see the small uh, triangular A-shaped houses, which are the residences of the different artists that come there for a week, two weeks, three weeks, etc. What uh, our, uh, the Open Opera brief asked us is to, to build a new pavilion and to just uh, next to the dome, to connect it to the dome. And in this new pavilion, we had to put um, an exhibition space and a working atelier for silk screen. So it needs to be an extension of the dome, but at the same time, a new pavilion. And of course, in architecture, to do an extension of a dome is a serious, uh, serious problem, uh, very complicated. And, um, but I think the first, the first and very basic decision we had was to say that we cannot do a box here, that it was completely impossible to just put a square next to that, and that in this kind of very strange uh, uh, platonic volumes in the landscape environment, we need to come up with something else. So this is a, a drawing that kind of resumes the design decisions, uh, which is, uh, if you look at the top left, uh, I have a, yes, here. Uh, so first we decided to put a, a cylinder just next to the existing dome, so it's a circle as well. It's a glass cylinder, but with a conic roof, together like that. And then we just take out parts, just like parts of a cake, like you see here, 
All the walls uh, here are uh, brick walls, and all the outside uh, walls are, uh, are um, glass screen, screen wall. And so what you have as a kind of disposition is that in the center you have, it's very high, it's six and a half meters, but on periphery it's two and a half meters. So you have at the same time this panorama towards the landscape, and at the same time a very urban condition in the center of the building because you have this height and it's really like a street corner or several street corners all together. So it's the same time an urban space and the same time something very uh, open to the territory. This is the plan. So you can see the circle next to the other one, the connection between them and all these different fingers. Our intention was, let's say, first to kind of, today there is some kind of strange meeting place just here, which is in the center of all that. It looks a little bit like Pierre et Vacances. I don't know if you know what's that. It's a yeah, vacation village or something like that. Whereas the guys that work there uh, are really urban. Huh? They come from everywhere, from the US, from whatever, and they're a bit artistic. Uh, so we found that it was extremely bizarre to organize this kind of uh, enclosed space for them to meet and have beers and talk together. Uh, we thought it was interesting to somehow try to complete this figure, the meeting figure, with the, each one in, in front of his machine figure, by a figure which is completely open to landscape, and that somehow stimulates relation to the outside and also isolation, which is necessary for these kind of people. Uh, it was also an occasion to have these kind of open panoramas on the landscape, very beautiful camp and lamp landscape all around, very open, very different from the Flemish uh, ordinary soup. There was nothing particular to actually frame because all the landscape was, let's say, equally nice. So it was just the possibility of separating them. And then uh, this, this is a strange drawing. We just try to fold out the, uh, the thing from the center of the circle with all the different uh, spaces like that. And then these are the, the six courtyards all around the buildings. So this is the plan. Uh, to say a few words, this is the entrance, so it's just a small entrance. This is the exhibition hall with the archives in the middle, and all that are the drawing and uh, silk screen ateliers. And then it connects to the existing dome. So it's very simple. There are toilets also here, workshop, but no stair, nothing. It's a very small building. <coughs> the, maybe to say a word about the shape. Um, so I, I explained the protocol. It's a, it's a circle. We took out uh, pieces. But then we also wanted to avoid uh, the panopticon effect because it was very important to have some kind of privacy uh, inside of it. So this is the reason that the, the shape is actually a bit clumsy like that. Because uh, if you think, of, you, you can see it here actually in the scheme, when you're inside the finger, let's say, everyone sees the center, but no one sees uh, further on. So uh, when you're here, for example, you have this kind of privacy effect, but at the same time you are connected to the center. But there's no panopticon that crosses all around. A at least this is what we try to do. So here you can see, for example, um, this kind of, we, we didn't want to separate exhibition and production. For us, this was very important. Uh, we wanted people to just, you know, adventure and just try to figure out what the artists were doing, etc. Not to separate, no doors. So on the left image, you can see that how the atelier is seen from the exhibition space and the other one is how the exhibition space is seen from the atelier. So it's really this uh, relationship that was very interesting for us. This is a model about the connection with the, with the dome. And then the roof was, was, a big, was a big issue because it's very difficult to do a roof uh, which is conical in terms of geometry. The most easy uh, way would have been to just uh, draw uh, important beams from the apex to the periphery, like that, like a tent, uh, and then to connect them all together. But we didn't want that because it creates uh, a lot of hierarchy in the structure and in hierarchical space. We wanted a non-hierarchical space in which everything is somehow the same. And so we worked on that principle of reciprocal beams, which is a very ancient principle, also used in the Renaissance to create bigger spans uh, using shorter beams, that this I think everyone knows. But then we try to transform it into a dome. Uh, so that means to, you can see that it's really exactly the same geometry. You have this sort of square in the middle and then each of the four beams are just prolonged, and it's the same thing here. So you have uh, this quadrilatère, 
with the beams, four beams all around, and the, the higher you go, the denser it becomes. But this was still two big beams, so we had to do uh, with smaller, very basic beams. Uh, so we arrived to that solution, so it's 25 different levels of reciprocity. And of course, when you have a bigger span, like here, they need to come together, and when you have a shorter span, you can stay, they can stay apart. And then we also uh, moved the, the apex, the top part of the cone, just here, above this point. We didn't want it to be at the center of the circle because this would have created an extreme, uh, extremely important point at the center of the building. So we had to do this kind of asymmetrical cone and to put the, the, the top part here to make it somehow disappear in order to create this continuity. This is a plan with the beams. And then we're slightly unsure whether this was really possible to build, so we did it in the model. Just, just a th third of the, of the building, uh, with actually starting from the drawing itself, cutting all the beams and then trying to put them all together. It was even in model extremely difficult because there is no beam that actually crosses the space on which you can actually connect other ones. So you just need to find your way uh, in the geometry. So we had to build this kind of substructure uh, and, and to put the beams on the substructure, like that. Yeah, this is a picture of the model, uh, once finished. An AXO construction site, which was quite photogenic. These are all the beams, 762, I think, all different, because actually because the, the, um, of the asymmetrical part, all the beams are unique. So they were all cut uh, one by one by a machine, uh, like that. And then what was very nice is that when they built the building, uh, they actually used the same method, uh, like the model, that they used the substructure, which is, goes towards the center, and then they, uh, yeah, like that. This is the substructure, and then they put all the beams on the substructure. And then, just like us, when we did the model, they were, I think, a little bit afraid to take the substructure away but it worked. So these are just a few pictures of the finished building. But uh, unfortunately, no machines, no artists for the moment. It's just open not so, uh, not so long ago, and they're still trying to figure out uh, how to use the space, where to put the machines, and all that. Yeah, maybe I didn't talk about the, there is some kind of peripheral uh, concrete uh, beam, circular one that works like that, it kind of stops the, the structure just, uh, just before the facade. Okay. This is something else. Um, it's a project we did in Denmark, um, in Aarhus, which is a very nice city. Um, uh, we were in it, which was the uh, European Capital of Culture in 2017. Um, we were selected as curators for the architectural event of that, um, of that year. And we invited two other architects, still Nakayama, uh, the Japanese architect, and Matilde Cassani, which is Italian, uh, to work together with us. Um, the question of the, let's say, the, the, the there was a theme for their uh, city, city of culture, uh, capital of culture, which was bridging. We thought it was maybe a little bit uh, not that uh, original, but still a very nice idea to have in Europe today to bridge things. Um, and we never went to Aarhus before doing our pitch and responding to this kind of open call. So we looked a bit of Google uh, Street View, tried to figure out what there was to bridge, and we just saw that the city was so... Um, nice with people drinking coffee everywhere on bikes, uh, enjoying uh, public space and all that. So we thought that the only interesting part might be to go to the harbor because this looked very strange. There was new developments by Big and all that, like uh, very strange buildings. Uh, at the same time, much more uh, uh, brutal uh, harbor environment, facilities and all that. So we, th we thought to ourselves that we could go there. So we did a short pitch. This is just the text that we attached to our pitch with the kind of scheme that translates uh, a little bit out of scale uh, the general idea. I will just um, read it shortly. 
The visual relation that the bridge, so the bridging uh, theme, uh, the visual relation that the bridge establishes with its surroundings are sometimes more interesting than the physical connection as such. A bridge crossing a river unveils the territorial and geographical dimension of the later and transforms the crossing into a delightful and always unique experience. We feel that today, a few years before the harbor changes into a friendly urban environment with people peacefully drinking cappuccinos, is the best moment to unveil its poetic beauty. The 1-1 one -one territorial magnets, this was the, let's say, concept, will dialogue with the natural roughness and austerity of the site, which we find poetic and unique. The aim is to avoid any softening of the port. The magnets will physically incorporate existing objects in the harbor and visually incorporate large-scale landscape. They will therefore offer rich interrelations between the paraphernalia of the harbor, cranes, unused machine trucks, gangways, etc., and large landscape panoramas, sunrise, endless sea, city skylight, starry sky, 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 sorry. This is the video that doesn't work. And so what we, what we tried to kind of come up with was something that was halfway between, let's say, architecture and urban furniture. Um, and what was the most important is to make it somehow interact with the landscape. Uh, we wanted to use this kind of poetic quality of the sea, of the horizon, of the changing uh, light and weather and all that, and to just try to captivate that, as well as to captivate objects, very basic objects of the harbor that were there, cranes, uh, light poles like you can see here, and to make them a part of the design and to respond to them by designing. Uh, this was our team, I already talked about that. And so the magnets were these kind of small machines. In the reality, they were much more uh, far away one from the other, but the idea was to somehow combine them all together and to create some kind of strange territory out of that. So I'll just flip through a few of them. This one uh, was by Nakayama. Uh, we actually chose the spot. Uh, we explained to him the idea of the magnet and we asked him to design a magnet here on this kind of dead end uh, with this uh, small uh, red uh, light, uh, lighthouse. What he did was to add to that lighthouse a kind of big tail like that uh, and a cylinder at the end. So it's just a long bench, a nine meter bench, going slightly up and becoming wider and wider and with a cylinder in the end. That means that when you come uh, on that direction, you see the cylinder and the lighthouse that are kind of uh, merged together. And then you just have the legs on each part of the, of the thing, which makes it into a centipede. Also with the eyes like that. Um, this was designed by us. There was just this uh, simple basic steel ramp uh, that allowed people to go down to the sea, which is kind of uh, uh, you don't find uh, often there uh, in the harbor. Uh, and we thought it was very nice to, to give it some kind of uh, special connection to the water and to the, uh, uh, to the horizon. So we just uh, come up with this kind of balloon, like a moon floating above it, and just adding to that these uh, lounge uh, chairs on the sides. Uh, so it became some kind of an event uh, with people sitting, people going down, and the moon that was suspended there also becoming, uh, was lit during the night. And what is also interesting is that we tried to place them in such a way that you can see the balloon over there. This is number two, this is number one, this is the bench, uh, in visual relationship, because the idea was also to make people discover the overall environment via these uh, magnets and their interrelations. This was another one by Nakayama. Uh, it's a lighthouse green this time uh, with a funny hat. Uh, so uh, he built this kind of, uh, how do you say that, like stairs uh, to look at the sea. But also when you come from the back, you just see a white wall. And then there were hats that people put on the, on the head, which are exactly like the hats of the uh, lighthouse. <coughs> or this one that was de uh, designed by Mathilde. That was, she actually chose not to design actual magnets, not, uh, not architecture, but just design flags. So she was uh, starting with the different identity of each one of the peers and tried to come up with symbols and things reacting to, this, uh, to these different identities of the changing uh, environment. And each of the peers had his own uh, uh, flag, which is quite big, six meters on four meters that were floating uh, 30 meter high uh, up in the air. In the air. This was something else that we designed, which was an extension 
uh, of a dome, uh, which was just a circular platform slightly uh, floating 80 centimeters above the ground with this beautiful panorama. I'll just flip through them. We also organized um, uh, some kind of film festival, which was just about harbor movies um, from Japan, Sweden, France, whatever, that were projected on this uh, very big concrete building. So the idea was to somehow bring people to watch these harbor movies, but also this is very visible from the city center to somehow bring the harbor into the city via these uh, images uh, on the wall. Also an exhibition. <coughs> Okay, a another project, this one in Genk, also an open op group. This one we did with the Lola Landscapes. Um, so it's in the um, sport park in Genk, uh, where you have these beautiful uh, swimming pools from the 70s. Uh, there was, I think, a first open op group uh, that asked for the extension of that. And actually the architects that won, Bell Architecten, they chose not to do an extension, but to build another big building next to the first one. And this created a new problem, what to do in between the two buildings. So this is where our open op group was. Uh, this is the original idea of the open op group. This is the original uh, swimming pool, very beautiful. And so you can see the Bell Architecten building on the right. It's also in the exhibition uh, upstairs. Um, what the brief was asking for was actually to do that. To, that means to create a public space in between the two buildings and to put a lot of open air activities inside, petanque, uh, basketball, uh, skating, and all that. We thought it was a very peculiar uh, idea to create some kind of urban moment in this uh, forest. Uh, also, there were these kind of two buildings which were really massive, nice, but not at all open towards the open space. So we didn't see exactly how this square could fit. So we, say, we said, OK, we can, we can try to design a square, but we would like to connect not only the two buildings, but also other sport activities, open air, in the park at a bigger scale. And we would also like to connect the forest and the river, which is downstairs, and to somehow create this kind of continuity between them. And so instead of uh, designing one space in between the two buildings, we would like to design three spaces with very different characteristics, very different geometries and relationship to the landscape. And then not to concentrate the open air activities in between the two buildings, but really to scatter them uh, throughout the woods uh, in a really nice uh, confrontations with nature and to really just uh, use the, the, the forest as an environment for the park. These are the three spaces. Uh, this is the actual master plan that we um, handed in. So you can see there is the first one, which is a gigantic strip of 600 meters through the forest. The second one is an esplanade in between the two buildings. These two are built today. And the third one uh, is a connection space in the, in the <coughs> bottom part. The idea about this strip was really to create an urban connection for the city. And then also to use uh, spaces in the forest uh, to put sport inside. These were uh, spaces in which there were a lot of pine trees, which were very bad for um, biodiversity in the forest. They were planted there for the mines, uh, because Genk is a mining city. And so we just took out all the pine trees and created these kind of clearings in the forest to do sports inside. And we really like the idea of to see it really as some kind of sport boulevard, the most urban part uh, of this park in which people can just skate, uh, pass with bicycle, and uh, just go and, and practice their own sports. So we really like the idea of doing something very, uh, very uh, narrow, six meters, going all the way and connecting all these kind of different uh, spaces. It's not red, it's gray. <coughs> Because the red uh, was really a problem in the reaction uh, to the falling leaves and to the, uh, all what you have, the, the moose uh, in the forest and all that. So we had to do it in gray concrete, but we still find it's uh, nice uh, in the relationship that it creates and all the different sport activities which are really in the forest. And then we needed to uh, find out what to do in between the two uh, big objects. Uh, that were not at all open towards this space. So um, we really battled a lot with this kind of design question. And um, 
we did some kind of uh, iconographical short study during the competition in which we tried to find images in which you had some kind of equivalence between two things a bit different and how they kind of interact and interrelate. Um, I'll just show a few of them like this one or this one um, in which the landscape kind of plays a very important role in the relationship in between the two figures. Uh, so we slightly came to, the came to the conclusion that instead of just connecting the two, we would like to add uh, some kind of third element uh, to the two. And so what we wanted to design was what we called an esplanade, a third object in between the two that you can see in the middle. So you see that there is a space in between the esplanade and the buildings. One, this is the Bell Architect and uh, Sport Hall on one side, this is the swimming pool. So there is a gap in between and so it somehow just exists as a kind of different objects slightly going out of the soft landscape all around it as an esplanade and giving a, a very nice view on the forest and the river. Um, also we had to find money to do that because the, 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 the budget was for one space and not two. So what we decided to do is to use uh, bluestone all around just for the edge of the rectangle and then the center to keep it completely in a stabilizer so a very uh, permeable and relatively cheap uh, material. So here you can see just a model uh, of, the, of the esplanade in between the two buildings. And then first uh, pictures of it uh, with very small trees for the moment, but that we hope that will become bigger and also that the parking that you can see uh, there will somehow disappear one day. And this is the third uh, space, but this will be maybe phase two, but not yet. Torhout. So this is the project which is presented upstairs. Uh, we did it with Lola. Um, it was, the commission was both for a master plan for the city center and for a town square and for a town square. Um, the day we went there, there was this market. There was also this beautiful picture that we received. Uh, so we were really kind of fascinated by the fact that it's a relatively small town, uh, not extremely urban, not extremely interesting in architectural terms, but that this market was very present and was a kind of DNA of the city. So this was for us really a starting point <coughs> to think of uh, this urban space as a very meaningful place uh, for all the kind of uh, what you call in French terroir all around it, uh, for mustard, uh, for uh, beer and all that, that is grown all around and that people every Wednesday bring uh, their goods and the center of the city. So it's a real center for a kind of large uh, scale uh, terroir all around it. Another uh, quality which kind of struck us in the beginning is that was, it was a, a relatively dense uh, town, but not so, uh, not so large. Uh, so you can actually have this kind of almost uh, immediate connection between the open landscape around it and the city center. You can do it by foot. So what we try to do in the master plan is to somehow combine all these scales and to pass from a scale of the forest and the open uh, fields and the humid uh, areas on the outer uh, circle to a more uh, smaller park uh, scale uh, next, to really pocket parks next, and to the city center, which is the square. So to really find this kind of onion uh, organization of the city. And the last one uh, which struck us was the relative um, poverty of the quality of space and the quality of design. Of course, it's a market, so you, you need to take out the furniture uh, in order to make it work. But we really felt that there was a real need uh, to do a lot of effort uh, and attention to every detail in terms of design, whether it was architectural design or design of the public spaces. And that's, uh, this quality was extremely needed uh, in our context. This, for example, is the plan of the existing uh, square with all the different pavements that were just added and the parking places and the poles and all that. So the idea was to really find a much more uh, um, basic and continuous uh, treatment. We started with the market and with the idea that all these lorries and cars uh, were the, somehow the essence of the city. We tried to map exactly their positions, uh, the position of each lorry, its size and how it worked on market days. And then we thought that we could just slightly reorganize them. And to also with this kind of line geometry to create a kind of continuity because the square is, you're not sure if it's a street or a square, it has a very long and turning uh, 
speciality. So we thought that these lines could actually combine all these kind of different spaces into one uh, large uh, uh, square. And then these are uh, the lorries just rearranged on the new lines. There was this idea that, um, that uh, this is Piazza del Campo, uh, there are two uh, horse races per year, but somehow the kind of, there is some kind of permanence of the horses and all that in the design of the square. And so we really like the idea that this, there is some kind of permanence of the market outside of the market days. So the market is maybe just on Wednesday morning and two o'clock it's already over, but also when there is no market, the market is there. It can become somehow a, a part of the design, the architecture, the design of the square can really react uh, to the lorries, to this activity, which is very important. So you see these are uh, images we did during the competitions, uh, just to use natural stone, uh, um, and these kind of two colors and rotating lines. These are materials that we work with now. And the idea was that uh, potentially we try to make the square as nice uh, on uh, days, normal days as on market days. So we can see the kind of two images. Uh, and that there is still this kind of presence, although it's, uh, it's, it's big and there are not so much activities. Also what you can see on this image is that uh, we thought that this very mineral continuous space should be completed by green figures, which are the seven secret gardens. So there are a few of them on the image, one here, one here, one here, and one here, I think. Uh, but there were seven of them, some outside the model. <coughs> you can see them also here. And the idea was really uh, to work with this idea of seven sins and to create seven gardens which are really very small pocket gardens, sometimes like 200 square meters or 500 square meters, and to really create very strong uh, atmospheres which are connected to the market, but all very different. These are more current drawing of the existing square and the, um, and the project. There was also a question about this uh, old town hall which is here. Uh, at the center, which is today uh, not yet abandoned, but not using as a town hall. And the idea was to transform it in our competition, but this doesn't work very well for the moment, into some kind of pub, theater pub. Uh, we've, we've thought that this kind of very nice English typology in which you had this kind of theater on the top and pub on the bottom, which was very open to people, was a very nice uh, combination in the position of this building. We are still thinking about how to make it work and who could actually make this uh, happen over there. But what we are designing today is more is kind of esplanade in relation to the square, which is this kind of uh, strange uh, trapeze uh, in front. These are uh, recent models of the, of the square and the designs. Okay, I have one or two more. Um, this is also an open op group uh, that we won uh, a year ago or something uh, with Nakayama for elderly house, uh, Alzheimer elderly house in Wommelheim, which is um, Antwerp, uh, city next to Antwerp, let's say. Um, it's an existing center and like a lot of these places in Flanders today, the standards are changing and they want rooms which are bigger. Uh, they want to have uh, uh, washrooms inside the rooms, etc. So uh, they want to transform it. This is the existing uh, center, and this is the garden in front of the center. And when we went there, we felt that this was completely some kind of representation. And I never, uh, when I went there, see any old guy uh, in the garden. So we thought that it was really a shame that people cannot actually use the outside space. And what we tried to do in the project is to pass from this uh, existing situation in which you have a building inside a parcel with a park next to it, into that. That means to somehow create a more uh, synergy between the architecture and the open air and to make the, the garden or the park be a part of the building. So this is the scheme that we did. Uh, this is somehow an existing building that needs to stay. We wanted to put a public park, a real public park, uh, which is a part of the city here in the middle, connecting the church, the garden here, and different neighborhoods. 
and then uh, the, um, the elderly house is actually scattered into six clusters, which you see here, which have their own gardens but separated from the uh, big uh, public park. This is a model of it. So you see the different clusters. Sometimes there are two levels, one level or three levels. They all have their own gardens to the south. So they are all facing their, their gardens. And then there is this gallery, which is actually separating uh, the private garden from the public garden. Because also people uh, which have uh, dementia, they can at a certain stage uh, get lost. So it's very important to protect them and to keep them in some, time of, uh, some kind of enclosed uh, environment. And then each of the cluster has some kind of extension into the public domain, which is a small pavilion, which is a dining room and a living room, which just extends uh, the cluster into the public uh, realm. In the center of the, center of the system, there is the LDC, which is the public open restaurant, which is for people here, but also people from the city that can just come and eat uh, warm uh, meals over there. So it's a part of the park and the idea was really, like in the model, to open it up and to be really a building which is uh, crossed by the park. We wanted uh, to really work with these four scales, the room, the cluster, the public park and the city, and that according to the uh, let's say situation of each of the persons in the center, they can move from each scale to the upper scale uh, uh, depending on their independence. We really try to understand how the, the current center that you can see on the left was working in terms of uh, organization and also in terms of, um, how do you call that? Um, gestion. Management. Management. Uh, so trying to understand how many rooms were combined into each living room, dining room, etc., and try to shuffle just a bit. That means to really change everything, but uh, in maintaining uh, the way uh, the system was working and to really uh, yeah, change completely the, the spatial quality but maintain uh, the way that the system was functioning, working with the same components. This is a scheme about the cluster. So the idea of the cluster is each time it's the, it's the houses, of course, but it's also the garden, the inner garden that you can see on the top, the pavilion on the left, and the, this kind of a portico that you can see on the, uh, in between. You can see it by section and plan. So the portico is somehow facing uh, the garden. It's a covered space or more protected from, uh, from the rain, from the, from the wind, uh, also with light inside of it. And then on the other side, there is just a bench open towards the public park. And you can see that the pavilion is really a part of the park somehow. We wanted the gardens to be all a little bit different, also related to this uh, question of Alzheimer and perception of space. Uh, and also the different pavilion are some kind of variations on the same theme, so they are all square, but all uh, a little bit different with different uh, roofs, uh, different columns, etc. Like you can see in this drawing. It was also very uh, important for us to try to somehow stimulate uh, social interaction and exchanges, uh, because although it can appear uh, to young people a bit uh, superficial, uh, the exchanges between very, very old people, uh, uh, we thought that it was very important to somehow create conditions and situations in which this exchange was uh, stimulated. So to stimulate people through relation to the outside space and to the nature and to the landscape and also through uh, social interaction. This is a model of the first phase we are doing now. Um, uh, and you can see that there are actually, so there's a part of the old buildings th that still exist and we develop just the lower, uh, lower part here. So there is actually in the building, in the project, two parts. There is the more public part, which is here, which is with, let's say, gabled roof and wood architecture. And then there is the rooms. There are the rooms clusters here, with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, which are much more rational, more uh, simple. This is the gallery and how it connects things. So when it enters a pavilion, when it enters the clusters, it becomes an interior space with glazed roof. But when it's outside, it's completely wood and just with a handrail on one side and a bench on the other. This is a pavilion. Um, you can see the gallery on the right and the pavilion on the left. Uh, with all this wood structure and the uh, uh, yellow uh, metal beam that somehow crosses through the pavilion.
This is a competition image of the relation between the cluster and the portico. And the LDC that I explained that we wanted a very open uh, building. So uh, what we did for that is that the, it, it's actually composed of like it was three houses, except that the one in the middle is completely without uh, any structure. It's just suspended by the two other ones on the sides. To be able to completely open it up uh, during the summer and make the garden somehow enter uh, the building like that. So the idea is to really make this uh, connection in between the roofs as uh, thin as possible. And to really make the central uh, roof be supported by the two others in a very uh, light way. This is a structure model that explains how it works. Okay, I have a last project which is really a drawing project, so maybe it's interesting to show it. Uh, it's not a real project, there was no, um, no real client and it will never be built. Uh, it was uh, commissioned by the FRAC Orléans, which is some kind of um, architecture center in the city of Orléans in France. Um, and the reason for this project was that they wanted to see what they can do with their collection. They have an incredible collection of drawings of Super Studio, Archizoom, etc., etc. Uh, and each time they do exhibition about uh, bubbles, about architecture of the 60s, about this and that. And they wanted to see how their uh, collection can be somehow more operative, more uh, intriguing and something that we can work with. So they connected a few architects, uh, us as well, and they gave to each architect one image from the archive, mostly unknown images. And they just they didn't tell tell us what the image was, uh, who was the artist, who was the architect, and they just wanted us to do something with it. So this is the image we received. We we discovered later on that it was an artist called Mathieu Mercier that did this project in 2000, but we didn't know anything about that. So we just found the image a bit intriguing, something in between Super Studio and a pavilion, a, a very basic uh, outskirt pavilion. But we tried uh, through a series of drawings uh, to just understand the image and to just somehow unfold it. So there was, we did all these kind of sheets, I didn't put all of them, uh, in which we just try to understand uh, things. Here, for example, we try to understand the relationship between the orthogonal structure, the grid, and the more uh, kind of organic way the landscape was working in it, also in relation to Japanese architecture. Um, because you can see how the kind of organic uh, roads and, and all that kind of uh, paths are kind of working uh, in relation to that. This is this drawing. Oh, how, for example, there was this kind of iceberg or houseberg uh, um, uh, situation like that, in which you just have just the tip of the thing uh, going up and then the reflection of one on the top of the other. So the, the the plexiglass is, is transparent, but is at the same time reflecting the, the, the roof, like you can see here. Or in this beautiful uh, Sol Steinberg uh, drawing uh, on the bottom. The, the, the outside structure, exoskelet. Or also this was quite intriguing for us that it was not just a kind of super studio monument, I go back, sorry, to the image, this one. But it was really built like a table in the way that it had legs and then just a plateau uh, on the top of it. So we were kind of intrigued by, uh, by this architecture and by this kind of coffee table thing and by different uh, details uh, in the history of architecture in which you can just put a plateau uh, on a structure in a very kind of uh, uh, light way. You can also see it as some kind of temple with the building in the middle and all this kind of colonnade all around it. Um, and also the way, of course, it cuts, uh, it cuts through, just like the uh, Brunel film, or the idea of really, uh, really cutting through uh, the building. You can also imagine beautiful details. This is Sana uh, Kanagawa Art uh, Museum. We just, just, we just did this uh, stupid uh, uh, suburban scene uh, cut uh, uh, drawing. 
And then with that, we thought, okay, this is very nice, all this kind of redundant, um, we look at it from here, from here, from here, from here, from here. And then we wanted to, uh, instead of just multiply things, also to combine it into some kind of project and to do some kind of new architecture with that. So we did a house, uh, a house which is um, dig into uh, the ground like that, which is based on uh, some kind of coffee table uh, that you can see the center here with the structure and the glass on the top of it. And the house is, is on the bottom, so you have three levels. You have the level of the house itself with its inner garden. You have uh, this kind of in-between terrace here, and then you have the terrace on the roof. And then, of course, because this is a big glass uh, roof, we didn't want to have a stair uh, passing through, but just a kind of a, a stair just in front of it. So from the... From the um, street, you just see a very horizontal uh, line like that with the top of the table and things which are just on the table. And then uh, from the other side, of course, it's different. So this is the model uh, with the coffee uh, table. It's a bit stupid. And this is just the coffee table without the house. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the beautiful lecture. Are there some, uh, some questions in the audience about uh, the lecture? Thank you for the lecture. Um, I, I was actually wondering, um, are these drawings most of all um, operative within the practice and, and uh, building up a kind of language as well as a study of projects? Um, or uh, do they also help in the communication towards commissioners, for example? Do they get the drawings or is it really hard to communicate with these kind of uh, synth um, synthesizing drawings or um? Mm, I think sometimes they they kind of work as a communication sometimes they don't um, I don't know I don't know um, let's say for us when we started doing that it was not a communication strategy it was a way um, of trying to combine uh, different things into one drawing in order to express an idea. And to say, okay, we do architecture, we relate to a larger territory, or we try to relate to a larger territory. Both cannot fit on a page, so we need to find something, because what we try to express is these kind of complex relations, and the way this generates an interesting architecture. So for us, this was just simply language, a question of language, of being able to express ideas through drawings. Um, and then I think it was also important that they not become um, hermetic, uh, that they are not become our own language, but something uh, that you can understand. And so in that way, I think Steinberg is interesting for us because Steinberg is a caricaturist uh, and he was always you can, you can see the thing right away. And so there is a need also to make things simple, accessible, uh, and not just something in the history of architecture which is uh, completely isolated from the world. So I would say we created it more as a language or a way of expressing the project uh, or what we try to do in the project. Uh, but then it also became a, a way of communication uh, maybe afterwards, uh, but then, uh, I don't know, each time that we decide, huh, let's do some kind of uh, complicated drawing here. It's, it's never in order to convince or to sell something, it's always because there is some kind of idea that we discuss and we don't know how to draw it. So when we don't know how to draw it, we think, okay, let's take some time and try to build something. Um, I don't know if it answers the question. Uh, but then I guess also, just to go back, um, it's a language, but then it also has this kind of disadvantages of the language. That means that uh, 
uh, when you have new people coming to work in the office, they see the drawings and they say, oh, I don't know how to do that. Uh, that looks complicated. And also they feel maybe that they arrive in a little bit of a sect. Uh, or uh, that in order to be working in the office, you need to draw in that way. So somehow we are also fighting against the idea that this is, um, um, that it's a style, uh, or it's a completely uh, personalized uh, language or personalized style. We want to think of it as something which is completely open and that we continue to, uh, uh, change all the time and do all the, uh, other drawings all the time and that you're not obliged to draw in black and white and that it, yeah, anyhow. I, I have the impression that there's a way of observing and then uh, repositioning in a way. So that's ma mainly the methodology. You look neutrally in a way mm. in order to, to, to observe everything what is in space and different scales and different uh, dimensions and then you reposition it on the page and then it's also the project but that is repositioning objects that yes, are completely. there. Yeah. Mm. Relation. Yeah, I think um, you said something very interesting in the beginning in your sort of four words mm. introduction uh, and it was perhaps the shortest part in your introduction, the last one about fragmentation mm. um, where you uh, said something like, we're not after um, things coming together into a whole necessarily, and I think you even said a sort of a logical whole, mm. or some uh, should look at my notes, uh, something like that, so without things becoming, without becoming a logical whole. And now uh, you just suggested that um, you're after being able to, the idea is sort of a criterion for an idea when it's, or as design ideas ready, is when you're able to draw it. Uh, so that when you're not able to draw it yet, it's not clear yet. So there's two sorts of clarity that are very different. And one is something you can explain logically as a sort of my concept of my design is mm -hmm. this and this and this. And everything follows from that and there's some sort of a logical whole, which is a very different notion of, mm. of a sort of a consistency of a project than when the things you can draw together on a page we don't have to make sense. Uh, so could you perhaps tell some more about that or perhaps it's just very clear already, but uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, yeah, 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 you're right. I don't know. I need to think about that. Um, but um, it, let's say uh, it's just like the idea of the list that if you can combine things in a drawing that they are interrelated. If we find a way of interrelating them, then they are potentially interrelated. So you can say it's also a rhetorical exercise, but it's also, it must be convincing. Uh, the drawing should have some kind of a tilt effect, that when you look at it, you say, yes, this is, uh, this works together. Although uh, it's not on the same scale, it's completely uh, rearranged thing, uh, it's not a, a survey. Uh, so it's a, it's a process of, of, of combination and of putting things together and, yeah, trying to relate them. There was, um, uh, if I go back to Robert Bresson, the, the cinematographer, um, it, it's, I, I'm, I'm really, uh, I, I like a lot his films, but also the way he writes about his films. And he, for example, he wanted to use only what he called the kind of plate and neutral images. So no real actors, no beautiful images. Uh, if he had two beautiful images, he put them in the garbage. And then it's just the way that you combine one after the other that needs to create the emotion. The emotion never needs to come from the object itself, but just from the interrelation. And the way that you, ca you, you cut them and you put one after the other and you create some kind of a, um, tragedy or some kind of a beauty or emotion out of the assemblages of uh, very basic uh, elements. So I think it's a lot about this kind of interrelating and establishing connections between things. Are there some other questions in the audience? Um, okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank for you. The beautiful lecture.